Hello there, and welcome back to another AP Live video on AP Physics C, Electricity and Magnetism. My name is Easton Lander, and I'm coming at you live from the Kinder High School from the Performing and Visual Arts. Okay, wait, you have door one, door two, and door three. You don't know which one you're supposed to go into. And this might be something you're gonna be thinking about right now in terms of life, like what comes next after high school? But here's the thing, if you're an electron, you already know the answer. In this amazing world that you're in, you just follow the direction that the electric field is going to be the strongest. And as a result of that electric field pulling you that direction, you're actually going to be going against that flow. And as a result, you're going to end up exactly where you need to be with the lowest amount of resistance. Oh, to be an electron. Well, here's the thing. In this video, we're going to be exploring capacitor networks, resistor networks, and a couple of different things along the way, what I like to call the big four, which are some common circuit combinations that uh, if you're familiar with how those things work, can help you uh, work through other examples. But by the end of this video, hopefully when you see a circuit problem on the exam, you'll be like, yes, circuits, and you'll just ace it and move on with life. So this video is brought to you by the letter C, not for cookies, but for circuits, because that's where the magic happens. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, so what are we learning about in this video? In this video, as we talked about here, we're going to do a little bit of lingering thing with uh, dielectrics that uh, Sheila spoke about in video three. Uh, and from that, we're going to kind of morph it into these networks that we're going to work through kind of through the remainder of the, the video to see how we work with circuits. A couple lingering topics in terms of uh, how real batteries behave, as well as how current actually flows through circuits. But for the most part, we're all geared in right on circuits and how they end up operating. Um, as a reminder, here's all the equations that we're going to go through. This is a lot for this video. I recognize that. But here's the thing. These ones on the left are all having to do with capacitors that you might recognize some from the previous videos. Um, and then these ones on the right are having to do with circuits. If you look at your AP equation sheet, again, all the ones that are in black are going to be right there for you to reference. And then the ones that we have here in red might be ones that you might want to uh, remember or reference uh, so that you can be more successful on the actual exam itself. As a reminder, we have this amazing resource that you can go to and find uh, some resources there that you might find helpful. So that's the link there below. This is for this uh, whole series of videos, videos one through eight. So hopefully you find something there that is helpful and enjoyable. So here we go with dielectrics put in series and parallel. As a quick reminder, a dielectric was the thing that we put into a capacitor that upon doing so, it decreases the electric field as a result of having those uh, dipole moments kind of appear within it. We're having the electric field battle against the electric field of the capacitors. But as a result of doing that, it actually increases the capacitance of the capacitor. We see that in our equation on the AP equation sheet with this kappa located right there. A vacuum by default is going to be one, and all other values for the dielectric are going to be greater than one. So for this thing that we have pictured here, it's just going to be a one plugged in, and that would be our capacitance of this capacitor. But what if we put dielectrics in? If we put one in, it would just replace the number. But if we put them split, we can do it in this orientation. When I do it this way, where I stack two dielectrics, I kind of have the top dielectric and this bottom one that are both some distance d over two just for simplicity, for half the distance across the plates. When I look at this, the only thing that's changed about it is I can think of it as like two separate capacitors. I have this top plate going to there for K2, and I have this bottom one that's this bottom section. When I look at this, I end up getting these two different capacitance, where the capacitance of the top one is going to be K2, epsilon naught A over D over 2, because it's half the distance, but the other one's just going to be kappa 1, or the dielectric for the first one. So we look at these. These are what we say are in series, because I go through one to then go through. There's no way I can get to the other plate without going through kappa 1 to get to kappa 2, or vice versa. Well, here's the other arrangement. And we put these things in parallel. When we put in parallel, I can get from this side to that side, or I can go from this side to the other side without ever having to go through the other dielectric. So what does this look like? This is going to be called parallel, and they're going to look more like this. If we do the same breakdown where we write their capacitances, I'm going to have that kappa 1, the area over 2 distance, and this is kappa 2, area over 2, that distance. Fun little comparison here is that here, if I just look at what happens, is I end up doubling uh, the capacitance, right? Because this half goes to the top. We're here end up having uh, that capacitance. So kind of something interesting to kind of ponder there. We're going to explore this more on the next slide. So when we have these capacitance set up as a series versus a parallel example, there's a couple things we want to keep track of, and that's the behavior of the voltage and the charge as we compare them. So when we put these things in series, or sorry, before I even put them in series, this whole thing is represented as a voltage between these two plates, V and a charge on each surface, Q. I'm going to call the charge that goes on this top one, QS, for the Q when they're in series, 
and we'll call the Q that's on this bottom one QP for the Q that they, when they are in parallel. So looking at the geometry of this, and we're gonna start with series. When I look at this, it looks like the voltage is being split because I have part of the voltage for the top part and part of the voltage for the bottom part. And sure enough, when we look at this as V1 and V2, the total voltage V is just equal to V1 plus V2. When I'm saying V there, I'm talking about the voltage or the potential difference across those plates. So if you'd rather call this Delta V1 and Delta V2, go for it. I'm just talking about um, that value. So here's the thing though, even though the voltage gets split, the entire charge that's on this plate is lined up with the entire charge on that plate through all of them. So because that's the case, my charge is actually gonna be identical when they're in series. Put it a different way, when we look at this little schematic diagram of our uh, capacitors that are here, as it travels up this way, if one electron were to push to here, then it would eject another electron there, which would then go that way. We just have one electron kind of going through in a series. In a series, the charge is what stays the same. And we can see that in this picture. Let's look at parallel. So for parallel, once again, I have these voltages as V1Q1, V2Q2, not the same as the ones above, just as comparison. Here, it looks like the voltages from this plate to that plate are the same because I'm going from that plate to that plate going through. And that's exactly what takes place because I'm going from one plate to the other one through K2 and one plate, and I see, keep saying K, it's Kappa, but we'll go, keep going with K. So Kappa as it goes through. And then the charge on the other hand is interesting. If the total charge in this plate is QP for Q parallel, not all the charge is lined up with Q, K2. As a result, it's the sum of the charges, QP, the total is equal to Q1 plus Q2. So look at the difference here. When they're in series, the voltage gets split, but when they're in parallel, the charge gets split. Or maybe put more easy to remember, when they're in series, the charge is the same across all capacitors versus when they're in parallel, it's the voltage that is the same as they go through. We'll explore this idea throughout this uh, video. So let's take these different setups and actually solve for what we call equivalent capacitance. I have some kappa one, kappa two, these two capacitors that are in series with each other. And I want to show what would the equivalent capacitance be if there was just some imaginary capacitor that just were to replace it. So one capacitor replacing. So looking at these equations that we took from the previous page, I can look at the top one and I can make a substitution using this relationship that capacitance is, or that change in voltage is equal to charge divided by the capacitance. And if I make that substitution, I get this QSC, SQ, and blah, blah, so on and so forth. And wouldn't you know it, because these are all the same, all of those cancel, and then uh, we get the equation on your equation sheet that capacitors placed in series are one over that equivalent capacitance is equal to the sum of the one overs of their other ones. Brief math note here. You cannot just do, like, you can't just flip it all at the beginning. Um, doing so is not math, doesn't work. Just try it real quick with fractions. If I do a half plus a half, I know that I should get one. But if I flip it from the beginning, I'd get two plus two, and that would give me four. Clearly not the same thing. So make sure you add up the right-hand side first as the one overs, and then you flip it. You can use the X equals negative one key on your calculator, which is really helpful. Um, but make sure you take the inverse of your answer. Let's do the same thing here with parallel. With parallel, I'm gonna start with this equation here and make the exact same substitution replacing my charge Q as C times V. Making that substitution, what's the same this time? All the Vs. So wouldn't you know it, the answer that I get is, ta-da! Whenever I have capacitances in parallel, it's just the sum of those capacitors that are in parallel. So this capacitor plus this one plus this one. This is a key difference to note, but here's the nice thing. On the AP equation sheet, they try to help you. C sub S means capacitors in series. C sub P means capacitors in parallel. So between those two, hopefully you're able to make sure you sort that one out. Let's see how we actually do this thing in practice. So, and from prior slides, we're gonna take this series example. Yes, it's gonna be a little bit messy, but I think it kind of drives the point home. Uh, if you were doing something like this on the AP exam, it would be as an FRQ. If this was a multiple choice, we would give you values or a much more simplified version uh, of all these. But let's just ride this thing out because I think it's a lot of fun to see. So we make these C2 being this value, C1 being that one. Remember, I already manipulated the D over two to the top to get to that point. So when I do this, I do one over, one over, one over, and that gives me one over, all this fun stuff that collapses to that. This is actually the answer uh, for it if you were to solve it through. I welcome you to try that as an exercise, but here's what I wanna show you that's actually kind of cool. Let's pretend that these K1 and K2s were actually the same. In other words, instead of having it be a dielectric that was split between two in a series fashion, that I just put it in as a single dielectric. If I make that substitution, here's what happens. 
these cancel, those cancel, and I'm just left with, wait, that equation should look familiar. And it's because it's the same equation that's given to you on the equation sheet for a capacitor. If all the dielectric is the exact same, of course it makes sense when this thing collapses to get the exact same equation. So this is just kind of prove it. I think it's kind of funsies. But if you work through this whole setup, that's what you end up getting. OK, let's look at the parallel case. When I look at the parallel case, very something similar is going to end up happening. I sum them up, adding them together. And once again, I get to this final answer. As a quick exercise, I'm not going to do it again. But if you assume that k1 equals k2, what should you get? Correct, that other equation. Let's look at capacitor networks. Capacitor networks are going to be what you see most often um, in terms of giving you actual numbers for capacitance. The unit for capacitance is farads. In this particular case, it's a mu farad. You're like, wait, what's mu? Mu stands for micro. These are those metric prefixes. They tend to pop up uh, for capacitance pretty often just because a farad is a lot of capacitance, like a lot. But on the AP equation sheet, you see the metric prefix table on the front. If ever you see something that looks a little bit weird before a variable that you might recognize, it, chances are it's a metric prefix. So be familiar with those, but here we go. So I want to collapse this to find the equivalent capacitance. You're welcome to try this on your own first before I hop through it. But here we go. First thing I want to recognize is that these two here are in parallel. And you're like, well, aren't they kind of also in series? Well, sure, but I want to take the things that are purely one of the options first, either just series or just parallel. So because of that, these two are clearly just in parallel, and I'm going to collapse those down to get an equivalent resistance. It's going to look something like this. So the 16 is still there, the 4 is still there, and these two collapse to get to there. How do I do it? Since they're in uh, parallel with each other, I just add them up. And sure enough, I'm just going to get my four microfarads. Great. But now that I've collapsed these two together, I have all of these that are located in the series. So now with that series setup, I got to do the same thing to collapse just a single capacitor that has a given capacitance, doing the 1 over C in this case. So fun mathy math math, 1 over 4, 1 over 4, 1 over 16, gives me this 9 over 16. But again, that's not the answer. We have to flip it. And our, oops, too far. Our final answer there is our 1.78 microfarads. If this was a multiple choice, chances are it might stay in fraction form. Um, but if this was a free response, then you'd write there as your um, decimal, remember the two to four significant figures as you work your way through. Excellent. Now let's talk about wires and resistors. Don't worry, we're going to come back to those capacitors. So for a wire and resistors, how do they work fundamentally? If I have a section of wire, it has all these charge carriers in it. Electrons are the actual charge characters. Like that is, as we learned in uh, video two, hey, with me, right? With electrostatics, right? It's the negative electrons that are actually moving around. But due to Benjamin Franklin back in the day, he said, hey, the charges that are moving, those are going to be called positives. And he just happened to be wrong. We call the fact that it's the positive charges conventional current. This is actually stated on your AP equation sheet that the direction of current is always in the direction that positive charges would drift. You know, I say, but that's wrong. It's not, it's just a convention um, and we just go with it. If it says, what, what are the electrons doing? We know that it goes against the electric field. What are the positive charges doing? They're going with the electric field. So the word current, whenever you see it pop up, know that it means the movement of those positive charges. Notice I'm not saying the word protons. Protons are stuck inside the nucleus of that atom. They're not gonna be going anywhere. So it's this conceptual idea of a positive charge moving or more fancy, the holes that are in the circuit that are moving backwards. Okay, tomato, tomato, or not tomato, tomato. Back to this one. Let's just show a quick demo of what these electrons are doing. So looking at this section here, if we put an electric field on, these electrons are gonna drift their way into that next section. If you notice, they weren't moving all in the same line. They were kind of this little wonky thing. I like to think of these charge carriers like tumbleweed. They kind of get snagged every now and then on another atom that they kind of get drawn into and maybe another electron gets ejected out. So it's not as simple as just saying that they all just move in lockstep. And that's why we use this term called drift velocity. Let's expand on that a bit more. Our equation for current is just the change in amount of charge in a given amount of time that passes through a certain point in the circuit. The unit for that is a amp, which is also known as a, or ampere, I should say, shortened to an amp, which is a coulomb per second. But then we have this equation, which is a more advanced equation for current. It is on your AP equation sheet, uh, but as a student of mine said, um, you never going to use it. Why did he say that? Because it kind of says the word never um, right there. You might use it. So let's actually break this thing down. Um, so if we look at this equation, what's it talking about? We have this N, this E, this VD, and the A. Well, if we look at the units for it, what we're talking about is I being our coulombs per second. And this N is actually the number of charge, car 
carriers in a given volume. So this green thing I put here represents a given volume. If I were counting, there's a lot more electrons that are actually moving. Um, but one, two, three, four, five. I would say, oh, look, there's five electrons in that given section of wire that I've picked. This E is elementary charge from the front of your AP equation sheet, which stands for the number of coulombs per one of those charge carriers. This next thing, VD, is the drift velocity. So how fast are these charge carriers moving on average through that circuit? Yes, they might get snagged up, but they're drifting at this given velocity. That's what we call VD. And this A is then this cross-sectional area that we had there initially that was there in blue. If we look at how these things all cancel, what we're left with in the end is just coulombs per second. Where would a question like this pop up? Most likely in the multiple choice. But if you see something talking about drift velocity and it starts giving you things about how much, how many charge carriers are in a given volume, this equation should just jump to the forefront and be like, oh, that's the one I have to use that he talked about in that video. And that's on the equation sheet. But if it's not talking about drift velocity uh, and it's not referring to like cross-sectional areas and like charges per volume, you should really just be looking at this top equation uh, for current. Here's another equation that didn't pop up all that often, but it is on your equation sheet, so we should talk about it, where E stands for the electric field. Remember when I put this E up here initially, upon it going through the wire, we saw these charges start to move. And even in my intro, I talked about how electrons know which way to go in the circuit just magically. And it's because the electric field changes based on the resistivity of that uh, section of the wire. So a section that has a higher resistance is going to end up having, um, it's going to cause the current to drop down for the same given amount of electric field. So if we break this thing down, looking at it, we have Newtons per Coulomb, we have our ohm meters, which is our unit for uh, resistivity. And then we have J, which is this A is an area. This A stands for amps. So this is like coulombs per second for whatever. We don't sub it in. We leave it as amps. Um, but it's how many amps are traveling through a given cross-sectional area, just like we had here. So this cross-sectional area, how many amps are traveling through? If we break that thing down, we have an ohm is the same thing as a volt per amp. That causes the amps to cancel. And sure enough, when we break this thing down, we end up getting volts per meter. And the volts per meter is the same thing as a Newton per Coulomb, which is our unit for electric field. So this equation here, when do we use it? We're going to use it when we talk about electric fields in wires, or specifically electric fields in something that has a given resistivity to determine its uh, charge density as it travels through, or not charge, its current density as it travels through. Our last equation might be a little bit more familiar. This one, use a lot. Bottom one, use a lot. The middle ones, never or maybe every now and then. But this last one talks about the resistance in a given section of wire. What this one's referring to is for a given material, if your resistivity goes up, which is this value here for rho, if that resistivity increases, you're going to end up having a greater amount of resistance for a given amount of length. But also, if the length gets longer, longer wire, that also increases resistance. And if the cross-sectional area gets smaller, again, for all these equations, this area A is the cross-section, not the surface area, but if you were to take a slice. So once again, cross-section is if you slice a piece of bread and you were to put peanut butter on it, um, that is going to be your cross section, not the surface area where all the crust is. Sorry about that, uh, but just the uh, place where you're spreading your peanut butter. So the key thing with this last equation uh, is to always look out for that radius piece. Unless shown in a picture or stated otherwise, we assume that most wires are going to be have a circular cross section. So if you double the radius, that's actually going to be four times the area, which is going to cause our resistance to go down by a factor of four. So just look out for that. Uh, when you see these. So this is a quick little summation of a couple other equations that you might see popping up on that equation sheet. Let's get to solving circuits. We have these two circuit laws from Kirchhoff, loop rule and junction rule. Loop rule is just a restatement of conservation of energy. At the end of the day, it's just saying that the energy going into the system has to be the same that goes out of the system. You can't just keep gaining energy in a given loop. So if I start in a corner and go all the way around, let's get the thing here. We. If I go all the way around this setup, my VB minus my VR minus my VR2 minus VR2 has to give it to four. And you're like, wait, how come those are minuses? Should maybe done currents first, but you'll see that here happening in a second. When you go through a battery, the battery always has the positive terminal or negative terminal. Positive is the longer of the sides. That has higher potential. And we're going to draw pointing from lower to higher potential. So this arrow points that way. But as I go through a resistor, I end up losing energy per charge in the form of heat being released depending on it is, or might even be light if it happens to be a light bulb. 
the fact that energy leaves voltage once again is energy per charge so if i've lost energy i have less energy on the right and more on the left since voltage always since our voltage arrows we're going to always draw pointing from lower to higher potential that's why it points this way and if i go with a voltage arrow it's positive and against it it's negative so if i take another loop going this way vb minus vr1 minus vr3 minus vr4 has to equal zero and this little last loop here vr2 minus vr3 has to also then give me zero this is what loop rule says is if i complete one whole lap from a point to another point i have to get back to having zero because energy has to be conserved in that loop otherwise each loop you going around you'd either lose energy per charge would be weird or stranger still you'd keep gaining more and more energy and then you i don't know what you do with all that it's kind of fun to think about but no it doesn't happen that way so we shouldn't entertain that let's look at junction rule what junction rule states is it's really conservation of charge taking another step back indirectly it's also conservation of mass because remember charge is attached to our charge carriers whether it's the positives or actually our electrons and so we have we can't just be creating or losing electrons we have to keep track of them um so yes we're saying conservation of charge but indirectly this is also conservation of mass so if i look at this point up here at the top going into it i1 goes in and i'm saying that i2 and I3 are going out. So my junction rule or my junction equation or my node equation, I should say, is going to be one minus I2 minus I3 giving me that zero. You're going to see me throughout this video drawing current and voltage arrows. They're very, very helpful. I know I'm able to do colors on this video. You're only allowed your uh, pen slash pencil on the AP. So maybe you can have two colors there. But uh, what I would say is you can also do these closed arrows for current and then open ones for voltage. That's another way you can uh, show a difference between them. So closed for current, and then the voltage ones kind of look like a V. Okay, maybe not, but let's keep on moving. Let's look at a resistor network. We're gonna tie this thing all together. I have Ohm's law, which is I equals V over R, that is on your AP equation sheet. If they're in series, all that current is gonna be the same traveling through, but they're all gonna have different voltages. So when I do this, just like we did before with capacitors, I can say the current is identical because whatever goes in has to go to the next one, go to the next one. That's just uh, Kirchhoff's junction rule because there's no junction here. So by definition, it has to be the same. And the, if I did this as a loop, my voltage would be divided amidst those, not necessarily the same, depending on their resistances. If we sum all these terms in, just like before, all those I's cancel. And what are you left with? Ta -da! That resistance in a series is going to be the sum of them all in a series. Cool. We'll summarize how that compares in just a minute. If we put these things in parallel instead, in this case, if I look at loop rule, if I go this loop, V1 minus V2 has to equal zero, or V2 minus V3 equals zero, or the whole setup on the outside, no matter which loop I take, one minus the other one has to give me zero. Well, that must mean that, yes, my voltages are all equal when they're in parallel, and that's the currents that are different. Doing the same thing we did up above, if I do my V equals IR, making that substitution, once again, when I cancel out all those voltages, which have to be the same, we get this equation. I can't emphasize enough, this is the key idea behind uh, capacitors versus resistances in a circuit is that they behave differently. We're gonna summarize this on the review slide, but if you're thinking, wait, this is backwards, you're correct. Also, to be helpful, it does say RS, the S stands for series, and it does say RP, that P stands for parallel. So here's the big four. What are the big four? These are just common arrangements of resistors that if you can think through these, either on this slide or later, you kind of understand all the different ways we can try to, not necessarily, I don't need to say the word trick because that's not the goal. All the ways we can try to test and assess whether you fully understand what's going on with circuits. So for each of these circuits, just to make them a little bit different, I'm gonna assume that R1 is the smallest, R2 is bigger and R3 is the biggest. So when I look at this first circuit, they're all in a row, they're all in series. When we look at this circuit down here, they're all in parallel. When we look here, I have one in the series and they split. And we look here, I have two in series on one side and one on its own the other side, which those two then are then in parallel. So let's look at how each of these things behave. For this case, for series, if I take the equivalent resistance, I just add them up. In fact, of all these arrangements, this is the maximum resistance I can get with R1, R2, and R3. Maximizing resistance is when you always put them into a series with each other. With that in mind, because of junction rule, all the currents are going to be identical, so they have to be the same going through. And because of what I said up here above, just as a quick reminder, I know that my all my voltages have to add up, and I think I said this. No, I didn't. I could also state that my R3 is the greatest, R2 is next greatest, and R1 is going to be the least. But the key idea to take away here is that the sum of all those voltages equals the voltage between A and B. Great. Now let's hop down here to the parallel case. For this one to find the equivalent resistance, it's the one overs. As a matter of fact, this is always going to be the minimum amount of resistance that you can make in a given circuit. Putting everything in parallel is the minimum. 
maybe this helps, maybe it doesn't conceptually, but if you're working on a task and somebody says, hey, let me help you. Even if, let's say you're just trying to count pennies, they count one penny, that little bit of help still makes you finish the task a little bit faster. So any help you get in parallel is gonna increase the rate at which you can finish that task. The same thing is true in a circuit. All these resistors that we put in parallel, no matter how big they get, fun fact, oops, it's already there at the bottom, is that our equivalent resistance is always gonna be smaller than the smallest resistance. So whatever R1 is, even if the other resistors are like a million or a billion ohms, that little bit of help still makes it so it's gonna be less than your initial resistor of whatever that value is, because at least they're trying to help a little bit with the path. So in this case, unlike before, where the currents were the same, all the currents add up to equal the total current going between them. And we know because of these resistances here that I1 is gonna have the most current, I2 is gonna have the next, and I3 is gonna have the least because of Ohm's law with V equals IR. The voltages are all equivalent as we look through them because with loop rule, if I gain voltage through R1 and I lose it through R2, um, I guess if I'm going this way, I think I said that right. Yep, gain voltage, lose R2, that those have to be equal because there's only two terms that are there making equal zero. Let's look at this next case. For this one, my equivalent resistance is going to be R2, whatever it is, because it's in series, plus the resulting resistance of the other two in parallel. Remember, this to the negative one means to take the inverse of it. So it's one over, one over, and then the flip. Looking at the currents, I know that I1 plus I3 has to equal this recurrent going through I2 because those two have to come together. And that is then equal to my current going through my overall circuit. I also know that I2 has to be greater and that I1 has to be greater than I3 because once again, based on these uh, resistances, I3 has to have the least. Voltage is a little bit wonky, right? When I write this one, I know that the voltage of one has to equal the voltage of three. But if I look at the voltage from A to B, it's gonna be the voltage across RV2 or R2, I should say. And then it's gonna be plus either this route or that route. It's not both of them added together. So it's this one plus that one. So that's where we put things in series and then split them into parallel. You have to take a given path from A to B, depending which way you go. You don't do both. That brings us to our last one. For here, my equivalent resistance, I need to first add up R1 and R3 in series with each other, and then take the inverse of those two, adding that to the inverse of R R2. Doing that and then flipping it would then give me the equivalent resistance for the setup. Notice this is the maximum. This is the minimum, and these are somewhere in between. Depending on the exact values, you could determine which one of these would be greater. Actually, I think no matter what, this one will be, because R2 is always in series. I guess you could make a weird case that, anyways, I haven't actually solved it out. So ponder for yourself, try some numbers around. But the general idea here is what matters that the equivalent resistance is going to be that amount. Um, so then we look at the currents. For this one, we know that R1 and R3 have to have the same current because they're in series, and R2 is going to be different. So if I look at this path plus that path, it's going to give me what the total current is going into the circuit. And I know that R2 is going to be greater than the I, than I1, and that I1 is going to be equal to I3. And I know this because if R3 is greater in resistance than R2, this path has more resistance overall than that one. So no matter what, R2 has to have the greatest amount of current traveling through it. And then that brings us to our last case here, um, where we're comparing the voltages. So all these things that are here for the big four. If you can look at it and say, how does the current change? How does the voltage change? What's the same? What's different? And how do I find equivalent resistances? If you can do that with these four, try it with different numbers, plug it in yourself. Don't memorize these. Um, I know they're written in red and purple, but that's not to memorize. Uh, if you can understand the process to get here, that's what's important to take away. And these big four are kind of the common examples of how we can combine them in different ways that we can just add these into bigger circuits. But ultimately, these are what it all boils down to. So I think this is our last kind of lingering topic here before we actually start to summarize and practice some things. And this is on real batteries. An ideal battery has just the EMF. We call it, that's the electromotive force. Back in the day, we thought there was some force that was pushing electrons along. Um, but this EMF is the same thing as voltage. If ever you see this little E symbol, it's the same thing as our electric potential throughout that thing. This comes from the, actually we're getting ahead of ourselves for the chemistry, um, but we'll talk about that. So here, my terminal voltage, which is from VA to B, if I call that the terminals of the battery, it's equal to EMF. So EMF is a voltage. But if I have a real battery, I have an EMF and an internal resistance. So here's our battery. Get it? Um, yeah, I tried. Um, so we have this thing. There's a chemical reaction going on inside of this battery. Um, if you did this in chemistry, we call them redox, oxidation reduction reactions. And based on 
a battery is actually a series of cells of those chemical reactions that are taking place that we stack them um, to make it so they have a certain voltage output. The bigger the battery and the smaller the battery has nothing to do with the voltage. That has to do with how much of the chemical energy we have inside of that. So a, a D cell battery, even though it's larger, just has more energy inside of it than a AAA, which is significantly smaller. But the whole difference between those two is not the voltages, the EMFs, um, it's actually the internal resistance. Those D cell batteries have a lower internal resistance because of that greater surface area uh, compared to that one. Okay, that's outside the AP exam breadth. So hopping back in here, um, the internal is really based on how well the electrons can move to that terminal um, to get to their answer. So what does this look like in terms of the schematic? We're gonna write it more like this. So A to B represents our terminals, that if this one's considered to be real, it's just this magical thing that has EMF that lasts forever. But if it's a real battery, and you'd see this pop up if the exam said a non-ideal or a real battery, or if it said it was in an experiment and you were trying to find sources of error, you could then talk about how oh, because the battery has an internal resistance, it would cause blank to happen. So if it says ideal, it means it. We're not trying to be um, misleading in that thing, but if it does say real or a non-ideal, this is what we're referring to. So if we have a given current running through, we can write a given loop equation. And I'm saying loop here in quotes because we're not actually going in a loop, we're just going one way. But if I look at VAB, it's gonna be equal to the EMF minus the voltage from that R internal. Written differently, we're going to say V terminal is equal to EMF minus R, I, R internal. This is in red. It's worth remembering. It's not given to you on the AP equation sheet. It's not something that pops up a bunch. But if it does and you have this idea in your mind, you might, oh, that's that terminal equals EMF minus IR equation. And you can jump straight to it. Again, for a given battery, EMF is what it says on the label. A 1.5 volt battery, we're saying is its EMF. But as the battery ages, the EMF doesn't change, the internal resistance increases. And we can see this happen because if we do, if we drive more and more current through a given battery, that's a real battery, the lights end up dimming. We know that they shouldn't because when we put additional light bulbs in parallel, they should have the same voltage. But because you're pulling more and more current, you actually lose energy out through the battery itself. And if you do this for a while, you actually feel the battery starts to get warm. Um, and that's not good because you're just losing energy in the form of heat inside your battery instead of externally through your circuit. Okay, so there's real batteries versus those ideal ones. So here's our final topic here with circuits with, we're talking about is energy. You might recognize these ones on the left for capacitors uh, from Sheila's video for video three. We have this one half QV squared or one half QV, one half CV squared. And we also have the one that I didn't write here. Uh, that's that one half of Q squared over C. Those are your three different options for capacitors. How do we know how we use those? At a given moment in the circuit, how much charge does it have? How much voltage does it have? We just plug in and we can find the energy in that given capacitor. What I wanna focus on a little bit more here is with resistors. For resistors, we have this equation um, that power is equal to I times V. As a quick reminder, Watt is the unit for power? Yeah, it is, I was, I was telling you because Watt, yeah, okay. Okay, well, here's another one. Okay, so Watt is a joule per second. Yes, of course it is, right? It's not a question, it is. So watt is a joule per second. If we break this down, current is a coulomb per second, and then voltage is a joule per coulomb, and the coulombs cancel, so sure enough, we get watt. Okay, yeah, you're over. Yes, we get watts. It's, it's joules per second, fine, fine. Um, so then we have these two. Just like we had before with capacitors, how we could manipulate this together, if I take Ohm's law and plug it in, I can get two different arrangements of this power equation. One that's I squared R, another one that is V squared over R. And you're like, wow, there's so many equations. How do I know which one to use? The key idea here is you want to pick the equation that has one of them being a constant and the other one as your variable. So let's say you have a given wire that they're all in, all these resistors are in series. And I say, what's the power output of a given resistor? Or how does this resistor compare to another one? Wait, series you're thinking, oh, those all have the same current. Oh, I want to pick either this top equation or the bottom one because those have, those have current in it. Additionally, I probably gave you the resistances of each of those resistors. So because that's the case, I'd pick this equation because the same current, and I could see clearly that, oh, if the resistance doubles, it's gonna have twice the power output as if the original resistor did. But let's compare this to this example where if they were in parallel, if you had all these resistors in parallel, in that case, it's not the current that's the same, it's the voltage. So once again, I'd be looking at these two equations, but I'd wanna pick this one when they're in parallel because if they all have the same voltage, chances are I gave you the resistance, doubling the resistance here because it's on the bottom would cause me to have half the overall power output. So it seems weird, but in series, the higher resistance 
has more power, but in parallel, the lower resistance has more power. Relating this to light bulbs in your house, if you have a 60 watt versus 120 watt light bulb, the 120 watt light bulb has a lower resistance. And we know this, not just because of this equation, but because everything plugged into the wall is gonna be 120 volts and everything is hooked up in parallel for those circuits. So that's that piece. But what if we have a changing power as a function of time? Womp womp. You can't just use this. I mean, you can for that moment, but as far as finding out what the total energy would be, we have to take the sum of all the power times time. Now, up above, if it was a constant, power would just factor out. So power times time is just energy, sure. But if we have a function for power, it says this and this is a function of time t, then we need to make sure that we plug in those values, uh, integrate, and solve for the sum of all that power that was being output. Notice this one's in red. It is not on your AP equation sheet. So it's worth remembering that yes, power is just energy over time, joules per second, as is noted there. But if it's variable, we need to take the integral of power as a function of time. Perfect. Whew. So that was a lot, right? A lot of circuit things. Let's hop into review a couple of key ideas. Capacitors versus resistors. If you see a capacitor in series, we sum it up as the one over versus if it's a resistor in series, it's just when they're right in a row. Yes, these two are opposite. It's worth keeping apart, but again, we're very nice and there's this little S there. So that's how you know which one to use. For parallel, yes, it's just the flip where this is where we just add them up if it's a capacitor versus it's the one over for the resistors. This happens because of junction and loop rule. That's where those equations were kind of derived from. Um, and the reason why they behave opposite in this manner is because one's using V equals IR where the other one is that Q equals CV, right? For capacitance. So because that relationship, that's where they mix up. So here, when they're in series, they have the same charge and current when they travel through. I say charge slash current because really you don't really have current traveling through a capacitor. It's that the charges bump on this side and then the field bumps them on the opposite side. We can treat it as such, but that's really just charge accumulation. Where for resistors, it's the current actually flowing through for that one. For parallel, on the other hand, those do, for whatever route they take, have the same voltage or the same potential difference. As one final note, as a message from the future, Right? When we first have a capacitor, when the switch closes and there's no charge on the capacitor, it acts like a wire. On the flip side, huh, flip the switch. Anyways, after a long period of time, uh, when this thing, uh, when the capacitor is closed for a long time and it has all the charge in it, now I have the maximum voltage and we're going to say it acts like an open switch, or in other words, that no current flows. I bring this up just because maybe on one of the FRQs, this might be helpful uh, that we're going to practice. But again, by video eight, we are going to tackle this topic and you'll understand why uh, that's the case. So let's get to some practice as with last time, starting with the multiple choice. For this first one here, uh, to backing up again, for all of these, you're welcome to pause and then try it. I'm gonna just assume that you can pause whenever and we're just gonna start talking through it. So for this first one here, I see three capacitors in series. I'm thinking, wait, series, I have that equation on the equation sheet or I can just do the one over and it's gonna give me that one over six because if I do one over half, one over half, one over half, a little bit tricksy here, that's actually gonna be the same thing as two over one, two over one, two over one. I get six over one, but that is not the answer. Thankfully, it's not even here on the option thing, which is nice. We have to remember to flip it one last time. And when we do, uh, we end up getting our one sixth microfarads. So looking at this one, I have this dielectric that has been inserted between these two plates. And in the end, the question is asking uh, if the capacitance will increase if some quantity is decreased. And there's all these quantities listed. When I see problems like this, I want to think about what equations I have that tell me things about capacitance, because even though you don't want to just go equation shopping, a lot of these things are variables. Chances are there are variables in an equation. And all equations are is they're just representations of the relationships between all these different variables. So the one that jumps out to me, and yes, the answer is going to appear here, is that I have this equation. I have all these different terms I'm trying to break down that this thing decreases. So the only one that decreases, sure enough, is the bottom decreasing increases the top. Now you might say, wait, what about voltage? How come it's not in this equation? You're thinking of this equation. Yes, if you were to decrease the voltage, you might think that would also increase this capacitance term, but you have to remember this is not actually valid. Why? Because capacitance is a property of the capacitor's geometry. We derived this in the previous video and kind of a little bit at the beginning of this one, uh, where these are the terms affecting capacitance and because of the given capacitance charge and voltage have this relationship so changing voltage it does not change the capacitor you have to change 
the structure, either the spacing, the area, or what's in between the plates, the dielectric, to change the capacitance. Excellent. So now we have this one, one of my favorites. We have this metal sheet inserted in between. I want to know what the effective capacitance is going to be. So they say effective. I've also said equivalent capacitance. It's the same thing that we're looking for. So effective capacitance. The answer here is surprisingly C. And the reason why it is, is this is really two capacitors, C1 and C2, that are in series, where if we have this equation for capacitance, the only thing that's changed is that these are 1 over D. Or not 1 over D, but D over 2. I've halved the distance that was there originally. You could pick a number. I chose to stick here with variables. But C1 equaling C2, if I manipulate this, I get this equation. <clears throat> Remember, when they're in series, we have to sum them up the 1 overs. So when we do this 1 over 1 over thing, we end up getting this 2 over 2. Wait a second, it ends up canceling. And as a result, we're going to get, when we flip it, our final answer is going to be the same as the kappa epsilon A over D. It doesn't change it. This might seem surprising, but it's true. Physics, it's actually kind of cool too, because when you put this metal sheet in between, because we're, metals are conductors, we know the electric field between it is going to be zero, but it's going to shift the charges to make it so if it's an infinitely thin sheet, there's actually no loss of distance between the plates, and that's what causes it to be the exact same. Cool. Hooray. So looking at this one here, I want to know that when the switch is open, it shows one current. What's going to happen when the switch is closed? Answer here is it's going to increase slightly, but not double. There's a couple different ways to break this one down. Um, I think I just go through it one way. But if I look at these equations should come to mind in terms of I have things in series and things that are in parallel. As a brief note, because I don't know if I actually mentioned it along the way, uh, this is a symbol for an ammeter. And ammeters are always going to have, if they're ideal, they're going to have uh, zero internal resistance. They're just going to let current flow through. On the contrary, a voltmeter is always going to be attached in parallel. And a voltmeter attached in parallel, we assume, has really high resistance to make sure it stays in the same path. So if I didn't mention that along the way, there's that thing there. So A with a circle is an ammeter, and V with a little bracket thing is going to be our uh, voltmeter. So how come this is the case? If you want to break it down this way, you can find the equivalent resistance when it's open. It's just going to be the 15 plus the 20, which is 35 ohms. On the flip side, when you close it, we have to collapse these two. Hey, that, that kind of looks like one of the ones from the big four. Mm -hmm. So when we do that, we break this thing down here. This collapses down to a 15, and a 15 plus the 15 is just 30. So in order for the current to double, this would have to be non-existent. It's kind of weird, uh, but that would have to basically it would have to be 17 and a half, right? But it didn't. It only went down to 30. So that's why it's going to increase slightly, but not double. We know increase had to be the answer because of the fact that there was a now a new path for it to go through, which decreases the overall equivalent resistance for that path. But as far as why it didn't double, it's because it didn't decrease enough to make that happen. So as this current, as this resistance goes down, our current's going to increase, but not quite to double. For this last case here, I actually know we have one more after this one. The second to last case, um, I have this circuit here. I want to know what the resistance here is at R. Love this question. Answer there is going to be four ohms, which jump in your mind is this whole uh, ohms law for I equals V over R. And we're having all these little current errors that I'm drawing in. How do I know this is three? This one said it was one going that way. This was two going that way. And I have three that's going straight down the middle. As a result of going straight down the middle, I now know those. And I could find out these voltages. So that's going to be 4 volts. That's going to be 12 volts. Along this path, then, <clears throat> either way I go, <clears throat> if I go this direction, I get 12 volts. Or if I go this way, I also get 12 volts going through, which means the voltage across this section has to be ta -da, 12 volts. Once I have this as 12 volts and 3 amps, I just plug it in. I'm able to get my 4 ohms, and everything's all happy. So drawing these uh, voltage and current arrows is extremely helpful on a circuit diagram. I know I left the ones off for the voltage, so maybe I could have done that too. Um, but alas, when you're going through circuits, drawing on them is helpful. I just can't emphasize that enough. Uh, if you just are doing it all in your head, you might make a weird, silly mistake where maybe one of these arrows was going the wrong direction in your mind. So drawing them in is the most helpful way to make sure you get a circuit question right. So here's our final uh, multiple choice one, where I have different resistances and they're connected in parallel. What's true about each of the following? When we look at these types of questions, we just kind of want to go one by one and eliminate them for their truth or their falseness. So looking at the top one, the answer is B. But if I draw out my circuit, which I think is helpful to do again, if they just give it to you in words, I know that the voltage has to be the same across all of them. And that my current is going to decrease as a function of the resistance. As the resistance increases, my current is going to decrease. 
So because that's the case, is three times the current the one that is invalid. It's not three times bigger, it's three times smaller. So that's where I gets knocked out. The second one, yep, the potential difference is the same because that's what we drew here across our circuit for voltage. And this last thing, the power being greater, this goes back to that example that we talked about for energy and circuits. I look at this one and I want to pick the equation that something's a constant. Oh, the voltage is the constant for each of these, V. And so because that's the case, I want to pick that one. If the resistance increases, that's going to cause my power to decrease. So sure enough, that is not valid because the power is not the greatest through the 9 ohm resistor. Oops. So that's that one there. So it's going to be being the least amount. Great. So that then brings us to our practice FRQ. Just like before, you're welcome to pause this video and try to solve this one through, or we can kind of solve it in bits and steps. And then I'm going to kind of step through the solutions of each one, A, B, C, D, E, uh, one at a time as we go through. This one's from 1988. So when we look at this first setup uh, for our nine ohm, current through the 9 ohm resistor, how we break this one down is when time is equal to, initially this thing said it was connected a long time so that the currents have steady state. For after a long time, this capacitor acts like an open switch. It's though it's not even there. So the actual circuit that ends up taking place, if we break it down, we have the nine, the four, the eight, and the four. That then simplifies down to nine, four, and the 12. And if I break that down one step further, the four and the 12 collapse down to a three. So the equivalent resistance ends up being 12. That 12 ohms is across 120 volts. And as a result, if you divide that, you end up getting your 10 amps. But that's how you'd break this one down is recognizing, and again, this is from the future for video eight, that for something that's been in a uh, circuit for a very long time, that this is going to act like an open switch. Looking at B, the same thing continues. And now I want to find the current that's in this eight ohm resistor at the same point in time. Well, thankfully, from the previous problem, we already know that we have uh, the current traveling through and that this is the overall path that we're end up making as we go around. So if we break this thing down, if I know that this was 90 volts, because I had the 10 amps traveling through, and this has to be 120, that means this has to be 130 volts left over for this path. Yes, it's also 30 through the four, but we don't care about the four right now. So that's why we're just going to look at this one. If it's 30 volts across the total setup, the total resistance there is 12 ohms. And that's where this comes from in the key. They're saying, hey, 30 volts over 12 ohms gives me 2.5 amps going across it. This is one particular way to solve it, which is the way that I solved it for the circuit. But the fun thing about the AP exam, there's always multiple ways to do physics problems. And when I say by multiple ways, there's multiple right ways. So don't think that there's the one way to solve something. If you're following good physics principles and you're working your way through, show your work, chances are you might not be the published solution that goes up onto the website, but you might be one of the alternate solutions here if what you do pops up as a common alternate solution that people end up solving. So just know, any problem that you've solved, that if you look online at a sample problem and you don't see your solution there, if you got to the final answer and your physics was valid, it's a valid solution. You're going to get full credit for it. Don't feel like you have to just do it the AP way. You just have to make sure you show your work the correct physics way. And that's what we're grading for. That then brings us to C and D. For this one, if I had my previous information that I knew from earlier on for an FRQ, remember these things keep stacking, so it's worth drawing in. We're still in the same state where it's been charged for a long time. We know my current that's there. So sure enough, if I look at this whole entire circuit thing going around, if this one thing was 90 and the total thing was 30 volts, if this ended up being 20 by doing my 2.5 times eight, that means it leaves me 10 volts down here below. But here's the fun thing is that this loop for yellow has to be 10 volts and the one going that way for pink has to also be 10 volts because that is two routes that are in parallel. That's a loop rule for Kirchhoff. And that's why we get 10 volts for the voltage across the capacitor. As far as for the energy, that's finding the proper equation on the equation sheet and plugging in energy for the capacitor, which is that U sub C that you see listed there. So one half CV squared is what they went with. Um, you could have also, don't necessarily need to, could have solved for the charge and used one of the other equations. So hooray, plug it in. So then at some instant, the connection at point P fails. So that ends up failing, causing this whole section to go away. The resulting circuit then turns into this. And this is the part that might be a little bit wonky because when we look at this capacitor, it has this loop, which is the four, and there's that loop, which is the four. And then we have this loop, which is the eight, and then the four, which sums up to a total of 12. So when I look at this one, which is just what I talked about there, going all the way through, the current through this middle section where the four is compared to the current through the 12, I end up having three times the current because 
for the same voltage of these two paths, whatever the voltage might be, we're not necessarily needing to solve for it. Yes, we knew what it was initially, but just theoretically, whatever the voltage is, this thing has to be three times greater than that one because V equals IR. If my resistance is three times greater, then that means that my current has to be three times less. So that's how we get that relationship. As a result of doing that, we can then write a power equation. Seems crazy, but if I look at the power through the eight ohm resistor compared to the power through the total, I can break it down like the following, where I squared R, because I'm going to see how my I's compared to the, rate, the resistances that are there, I end up having, for just that path, it's going to be what I'm calling I squared times 8 ohms, divided by the total power, which is both routes, the I squared of 12 ohms, which is this outer one, and then the 3I squared times 4 ohms. When you break this down, we end up getting 8I squared over 48 I squared, or more simply one sixth. Wait, that's what pops up when you do these two fractions. And so you end up getting of the previous uh, energy answer that you got one sixth of that to give you your, your answer. Oops, one, two, step too far. So to look at this problem just one more time, this last step is a little bit different than what you might've expected for power. But if we're looking at any given moment of time, it's gonna be split proportionally through these resistors. And this idea of proportionality is kind of a key thing within physics. We recognize what's the same and what's different. And so if time is going to be the same, I can look at how this rate of energy change that for every one watt going through the eight to every six watts of the entire circuit, for any amount of time, that's going to be true for the entire discharge of the capacitor. So the end result is going to be one six. Awesome. There's this alternate solution that if you, after watching video eight, you're also welcome to use the calculus integral to solve it that way too. So after video eight, if you want to come back to this one and solve it that way, there you go. Two for the price of one. So what do we take away after all this wonderful physics that we've been doing over the past chunk of time? There's a few key ideas that we want to make sure. There are a lot of equations. Make sure you know capacitors versus resistors and that units are indeed going to be your friend as you go through. Um, if you don't know how the units break down for something on, a, on the equation sheet, it's worth saying these are the units for this one, this is the unit for that one, because the units help lead you to how we use the equations effectively. Um, series and parallel behaviors right, are just outcomes of Kirchhoff's circuit laws. So understanding that as we have uh, the loop rule being zero and that the conservation of charge that at a given junction, the current in has to equal the current out, that's where all of these equations for uh, equivalent resistances and equivalent capacitors ended up coming from. And last thing was drawing circuit and voltage or current and voltage arrows is extremely helpful on your circuit. Just because if you keep it all in your head, you might make a silly mistake, but putting it on your paper and labeling those things effectively can help you find success. Even if you're really good at the proportionality, you'd hate to make a mistake where you just happen to flip a sign and you thought something was adding when it should have been subtracting. So take the extra step, take a little moment to draw onto that paper. The exam tip for video four, uh, beyond the what key ideas from before, is how we graph correctly, as well as do linearization. So let's explore this just a little bit. Here's kind of the steps for graphing. And when I say graphing here, this is if the uh, AP exam were to say the word plot um, or graph, I guess, for that matter. This would not be sketch. Sketching is not this level. Um, sketching is just we're getting the two endpoints and you're drawing the lines connecting with proper concavity or the fact that it's straight. So here's how we're going to set up a graph. First thing I do is we make sure we set up our scale. And there is, there is this rule that you have to use more than half of each axis for your data. We try, when I say we, the AP exam tries to outline where you're going from uh, for your tallies here. Like so if this has four sections to it and this has three or whatever it might be to make it so you can make a fairly clean division. So you don't have to make like some weird fraction, but don't squish it into just a small corner. You have to use um, more than half of each axis. So doing that, I kind of set up my scale and plot like that. I label my axes with not only the symbol, the I and the V, but also their units. Don't forget to put the units there. That brings us to C. And then we plot our points. Ta -da. So plotting all these points in there, we then draw our trend line. The rule for a trend line is that you should have some data points above and some data points below. This is a great handy time to use a ruler, which we'll talk about in video eight as well. But as long as you have something that's generally above and below, you should be able to do just fine as long as you plotted your points there correctly. And a common trend that you might even see happening in more recent AP exams, they don't even make you plot the points. The points are already there for you and you just have to draw the trend line. So how wonderful if you have to plot them all, not the big of a deal, make sure you include those steps. But if steps one through three are already done for you, you're starting at drawing the trend line, make sure you have some points above, some points below following that trend. The next thing you wanna do is finding the slope where the key thing here, and maybe should like made this thing flash, was to not ever use data points. You're like, well, what about 
This one, this one's like almost right on the line. Can't I use it? No. Okay, there's a small asterisk there. If it's technically directly on the line, you can use it, but just avoid doing that. Pick points that are not on your line at all. Pick points that are clearly along your trend line, but that are not data points. So again, I just say one more time, don't pick data points ever. Okay, now that we've done that, I look at this little dot here. I got my 30, my six, I got my 15, three. This is not required, but again, it's helpful for the AP reader that's there trying to grade your exam. If they see these like, oh, those are the points they picked and that's where they popped in the equation. You're just trying to communicate effectively. And that's one way to do it. After you do this, we find our slope. So rise over our run and doing this thing, I get a slope that's equal to about 0 0.2 amps per volt. That's great. The question would probably ask you to relate it to something in the actual physical lab uh, that was taking place for that um, experimental design problem. But for this particular case, I'm just going to say, hey, try to connect it to some known equation that's there. What equation do we have that has I and V in it? Well, it's Ohm's law, V equals IR. But here's the tricky thing. V in this case was on this axis and, or sorry, I is on this axis. So that one's there. When I think of Y equals MX plus B, the V was my Y. So it ends up happening. I have to manipulate this equation around so that I is by itself is equal to one over R times V. And that means this term that I've circled is equal to your slope. Because again, if Y equals MX, Y equals my slope times my X values. So once I've done that, I can set the slope equal to that value, manipulate and solve for whatever it was for that particular lab. So in this case, I'm just solving for the resistance of, I guess, this wire during this experiment that I modified voltage and I measured the change of current. So I had some constant R in the circuit and I was just trying to find out what that resistance was. Cool. So this is the overall process when you're doing a graphing problem uh, for the AP exam. So make sure you don't forget one of these steps. And once again, do not use data points in your slope calculation. Great. Last thing is just linearization. What does linearization mean? So you read the little prompt off the other side, but I think it's easier to to see in a series of pictures. So here's this data that I made for force as a function of radius. So clearly, as this force, as this radius increases, the force is decreasing. That does not look like a line. But thankfully, I'm like, oh, maybe it looks a little bit like an inverse. Let me inverse it. So this next data set, I left f alone, and I just did one over r. So each of these values is just one over r of the previous one. That looks kind of liney. Let's take a look. I don't know. Maybe we could do better, right? This thing is a little bit above. It kind of looks almost like there's this like curving line trend to it. So let's try one last thing. If I do one over R squared of this initial value plotting against force, oh, wow, look at that. Now my trend line is directly in this line. This is known as linearization. If I plot force versus R, I get a nonlinear line. But if I plot force versus one over R squared, I get a linear one. If ever you're asked to linearize an equation, Oftentimes, it's going to be from relationships that you might be familiar with. Your goal is just to recognize those variables and pluck them out so you get y equals mx where all those things lumped together. In the end, this is what we should be thinking of is, oh, this is kind of like Coulomb's law, where I have this kqq 1 over r squared, where 1 over r squared equaled my x value, and then f equaled my y. And so the slope is then equal to this kqq term. They were both that charge, so I can plug that one in. And if I found the value, which I didn't do in this video, but if you were to go here and like find a point and find a point and actually find that slope divided across, you should get the experimental value for K. I based this data um, not necessarily on the fact that it was 99 for uh, Coulomb's law constant. So if you get something different, you're not wrong. Um, it's just because I wanted to make a series of graphs that wasn't that exact same thing. So I want to thank you for watching this entire video or at least watching the parts that you watch and listening to this thank you part uh, because it's been fun to have you here. I wish you the best on all of your circuit things as they go forward. And I want you to remember that if you take your time and draw those arrows, you should hopefully find success. Don't forget um, that you can also watch the previous videos, one, twos, and threes. Um, and you can also watch the next videos right after this, if you're just watching this after it's been posted. Also, feel free to subscribe to any of the videos in the AP Classroom, uh, not AP Classroom, on the, on the YouTube uh, College Board channel. But also don't forget about those other videos you can find in AP Classroom as additional resources for your help. Thank you again for uh, stopping by to watch this video. And I hope you have a great time. Bye.